Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War, which was Bang and Dang. And still in the Overland campaign as the two big armies continue to battle it out in Virginia. But we got a different sweet Virginia. Kind of part of the Overland campaign, but not... It's called the Valley Campaigns of 1864, which in reality, it's the Lynchburg Campaign. This war is over. I don't understand why it's even still going on. It's just ridiculous. There's no Mississippi for the South. There's no railroads anymore. Rare, barely any. Well, especially after this Atlanta campaign, which we will have another battle in that. And plus, we uh, finally come back to the Red River campaign that we were covering a few episodes ago. We got a little small guy from that. Which will... It's Virginia and Georgia, basically, keeping them afloat. It should be done and over with. Pretty much. They have nothing in Missouri. They have nothing in uh, Louisiana. They have nothing in Texas. They have nothing in uh, Alabama. They have nothing nowhere. Carolinas don't count. Shit, I don't even remember the last time we were in Carolina. Either of them. That little naval thing there that didn't right. happen, but... Uh, that was all the beginning of the war, though. Mm-hmm. We got the Battle of New Market, the Battle of Mansura, and the Battle of Dare, uh, uh, Adairsville. Um, three separate campaigns, but uh, the New Market one is pretty significant, as well as the Adairsville. Before that, go check out our YouTube channel at Bang Dang Network, where not only do we post full episodes of this show, also our Outlaws and Gunslinger show, and Lee and Corey on the case, plus our exclusive YouTube-only Dart League. That is uh, only our only video podcasts or video um, content, I guess you could say. And if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, give us a review, share us with your friends, and answer that Spotify question. Moving on, well, going to the Battle of New Market up first, May 15th. In Virginia, during the Valley Campaigns of 1864, which said is really the Lynchburg campaign. So I don't know why it's only like three battles. Spring of 1864, Union Commander-in-Chief Ulysses Grant, S. Grant, set in motion a grand strategy designed to press the Confederacy into submission. Control of the strategically important and agriculturally rich Shenandoah Valley was a key element in Grant's plans. Grant's plans? <laughs> <laughs> While he confronted General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in the Eastern... Which is severely depleted... Who's he have? Longstreet left. That's it. And what happened to him? Well, all right, I haven't seen him in uh, a couple of battles. All these guys are dead. Mm-hmm. But uh, he wanted to confront E. Lee in the eastern part of the state. Grant ordered Major General Franz Siegel's army of ten thousand to secure the valley and threaten Lee's flank, starting with the Valley Campaigns of eighteen sixty four. All right. Well, he Siegel. He would advance on Staunton, Virginia, in order to link up with another Union column. Commanded by George Crook, I'm not a crook, uh, which would advance from West Virginia and destroy the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad and other Confederate industries in the area. Siegel's force told about 9,000 men, 28 cannons, divided into an infantry division commanded by Brigadier General Jeremiah C. Sullivan and a cavalry division commanded by Major General Julius Stahl. Uh, detentions made during the campaign reduced the Union force to about 6,300 by the time of the battle, though. Hmm. Receiving word that the Union Army had entered the valley, Major General John Breckenridge, we got Breckenridge hmm. still, pulled together all available forces to repulse the latest threat. His command consisted of two infantry brigades under John Eccles and General Gabriel Wharton, cavalry brigade commanded by General John M. Bowden and other independent commands and others. And others. This included the Cadet Corps of VMI, which had an infantry battalion of 247 cadets <laughs> commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Scott Ship. And a two-gun artillery section. A bunch Bang. of cadets running around. Oh. Fantastic. I like it. Well, Breckenridge, he concentrated his infantry at Staunton. While in Baden, he slowed Seagal's movement southward along the valley. Morning, May 13, 1864. Breckenridge decided to move north to attack Seagull instead of waiting for Seagull to reach Staunton. By evening of 14th of May, Seagull's advance forces had reached a position north of the village of New Market. While Breckenridge was at Lacey Spring about eight miles south of New Market. The old ribs started toward the Union positions at 1 a.m. on the 15th of May, hoping to trap and crush the Union Army. Mm-hmm. I hope. I'm Let's hoping. Take a look at this old uh, Department of West Virginia. We got the 1st Infantry Division, 
Well, it's overall commanded by Fran Siegel, 1st Infantry, Infantry Division, Brigadier General Jeremiah Sullivan, the 1st Brigade of Colonel Augustus Moore with the 18th Connecticut, the 28th Ohio, the 116th Ohio, and the 123rd Ohio. Fantastic. 2nd Brigade, commanded by Joseph Thorburn, Colonel jo- Joseph. Got the 34th Massachusetts, 54th Pennsylvania, the 1st West Virginia, and the 12th West Virginia. Got the 1st Cavalry Division, commanded by Brigadier Major General Julius Stahel. Stahel? Stahel? First brigade of that is Colonel William B. Tibbetts, who's got the first New York, which is a veteran. Uh, what is this a unit? All right. We got the first New York uh, Lincoln, first Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, twenty first New York, fourteenth Pennsylvania. The second brigade was under Colonel John Wincoop. We got the fifteenth New York, twentieth Pennsylvania, and the twenty second Pennsylvania. Sweet. And we got artillery, which included the first Maryland Light Battery B, New York Light Thirtieth Battery. First West Virginia Light Battery D and the First West Virginia Light Battery G. Plus, we got the Fifth United States Battery B. Cool. So that's a federal one right, right there. Right, look at them coming in strong, huh? Take a look at the old uh, Department of West Virginia Major General John Breckinridge for commanding the old Rebs. He had uh, an infantry division with First Brigade is Brigadier General John Eccles. He has a Twenty Second Virginia, Twenty Third Virginia Infantry Battalion, Twenty Sixth Virginia Infantry Battalion. Second Brigade under that is Brigadier General Gabriel Wharton. He had the 51st Virginia, 62nd Virginia Mounted Infantry, but they were dismounted. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> the 30th Virginia Battalion Sharpshooters and the 1st Missouri Cavalry, which was Company A, and they were dismounted as well. Hmm. Uh, unattached. Um, hmm? <laughs> unattached, but attached. <laughs> right. Let's see. We got uh, attached commands were Hart's Engineer Company. Augusta Rockingham Reserves, Davis's Company, Maryland Cavalry. And then for Cavalry, we had Brigadier John Embodden. He's got the 18th Virginia, 23rd Virginia, 43rd Virginia Battalion, Partisans, 2nd Maryland Battalion, and McNeil's Company, Partisans. And then we got some artillery with Major William McLaughlin calling the shots there. You got Chapman's Virginia Battery, Jackson's Virginia Battery, McClanahan, McClanahan's Battery of Virginia, and you got VMI section. It was all the cadets. All right. Well, look at the uh, rebels actually got a, right. more stuff than they usually got there. May 14th, the delay in action was fought at Rudes Hill, just outside of Mount Jackson by elements of the Confederate 18th Virginia, under uh, which was cavalry under the overall command of Colonel John M. Bowden. Right. Confederate cavalry slowed the Union advance, enabling General John Breckinridge to gather the main body of his Confederate forces at New Market, oh. which is four miles away. Nice. Two forces made contact south of Newmarket about mid-morning with the main Union line west of the town near the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. Colonel Augustus Moore initially commanded the Union forces present on the battlefield at this time, which consisted of his infantry brigade and part of John Wincoop's cavalry. Fantastic. That worked out, huh? Additional blue coat regiments arrived throughout the morning, deployed between the North Fork, North Fork of the Shenandoah River and the Valley Turnpike, with the main line centered at Mainers Hill. Maynard. <laughs> Maynard. <laughs> Breckenridge deployed Wharton's brigade on the old ribs left side of the um, Valley of Turnpike and Eco's brigade on the right along the pike. Eco's was ill that morning, so his brigade was commanded by Colonel George Patton Sr. Oh. Really? Mm-hmm. The VMI cadets battalion was kept in reserve, while Baden's cavalry was east of the turnpike. Okay. All right. Brackenridge attempted to lure the Federals into attacking him using cavalry and artillery, but Moore refused to move from his position. Okay. 11 a.m., Brackenridge decided to launch an attack on Moore using his infantry while Bowden's brigade crossed Smith's Creek east of Newmarket, rode north, and recrossed the stream behind the Union lines. All right. Union Cavalry General Stahel arrived at Newmarket at this time with additional troops, followed shortly after by Union General Siegel. Fantastic. Worked out well, didn't it? Brackenridge launched his infantry attack near noon. Slowly pushing Moore's infantry brigade off Manners Hill and northward toward the rest of Siegel's army, which was deploying on a hill north of Jacob Bushong's farm, known as Bushong's Hill. Once past the town of New Market, the old Rebs halted to dress ranks, shift units along the line, and reposition the artillery. Breckenridge, he resumed his attack about 2 p.m. As the old Rebs line formed near the Bushong farm, Massed Union rifle and artillery fire disorganized the old rebels in the center, forcing the right wing of the 51st Virginia Infantry and the 30th Virginia Infantry Battalion to retreat in confusion, while the rest of the old Confederates, 
They stalled. They stalled out. Breckenridge reluctantly ordered the VMI Cadet Battalion to fill the gap. He's like, damn it. Mm. While the battalion was moving forward to the Bushong Orchard, ship was wounded and was replaced by Captain Henry Wise. Uh Uh-oh. At this time, Siegel launched two counterattacks. On the Union left, Stahl launched a mounted charge with the cavalry, but was routed by heavy fire from Confederate artillery, oh. while the three infantry regiments attacked on the Union right and were repulsed as well. Okay. The main cause of the failure of the infantry attacks was confusion within the ranks of the Union commanders. Oh, come on. Siegel was noted to be shouting orders in his native language of German. Oh, you dumb. Hey, dude, you're right. talking to a bunch of Americans here, buddy. What the hell? After the repulses of the Union attacks, Breckenridge started his advance again shortly after 3 p.m. With his infantry force while crossing a field near Bushong's orchard. Several VMI cadets lost their shoes in the mud, which led to the field being called the Field of Lost Shoes. There's a movie on that, too. Maybe. There it is. It's called The Field of Lost Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it the other day. Yeah. It's decent. <laughs> as Confederate line got closer to the old Union artillery, Siegel's batteries were forced to retreat as the infantry started breaking towards the rear. Five cannons were abandoned to the ribs one of which was captured by a VMI cadet battalion. Fantastic. Uh, Battery B of the 5th U.S. Artillery, which had just arrived on a field, and two infantry regiments slowed the old rebel pursuit. At this time, Breckenridge halted his forces until the supply trains arrived to resupply his 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 soldiers. All right. While the infantry was being resupplied, the Confederate cavalry general Imboden arrived with his brigade with the news that the creek was too swollen to be crossed. Mm. Union General Sullivan arrived during this time with the 28th and 116th Ohio Infantry, Siegel managed to organize a rear guard on Roots Hill with Sullivan's infantry east of the turnpike, some of Stahlhill's cavalry west of the road, and the artillery behind the line. All right. Due to the exhaustion of the men and low ammo, Siegel decided to retreat across the Shenandoah River to Mount Jackson. Okay. Breckenridge advanced his artillery to the crest of Roods Hill, where they shelled Siegel's retreating Federals. Oh, shit. The Union Army managed to cross Mill Creek at Mount Jackson and burn the bridge before the Confederates could catch up. They always Union, burning bridges. Union you know, always burning bridges. <laughs> Union casualties, 841 for the battle, 96 moited, 520 murdered, 225 captured Five and missing. Five wounded. <laughs> yeah, 520 mo- wounded. <laughs> wounded. Wounded. 520 wounded. They're just looking across the bank. <laughs> Bunch of Confederates mooning them. <laughs> 225 captured or missing. This is the casualty rate of 13.4%. That's one that's, of the highest we've seen in that, Union. That's high. The old Rebs, they lost 43 moited. 10 cadets, including in that moita. Them are a good ones to lose. Oh. 474 wounded. Well, not really. Those cadets you need if you're going right. to continue right. this war. They're the bad ones to lose, I guess. Right. 474 wounded and three missing, only which is 13% of the army, oh. which is a common oh. theme for the old ribs. Usually. The wounded from the battle were cared for in Bushong's barn and in the town at the Smith Creek Baptist Church and at a warehouse while the dead were buried in the graveyard of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church. Hmm. Siegel, he staged a rapid retreat northward to Strasburg, leaving the field and the valley to the Breckenridge's army. He's like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Mm, well, after learning of this Union defeat, Grant became furious and replaced Siegel with General David Hunter. Ooh. Siegel was assigned to command the department's reserve division based in Harper's Ferry. <laughs> Sergeant James Byrne of the 1st West Virginia Infantry received the Medal of Honor in 1896 for saving the regimental flag in the battle. No shit. Good for you, James. All right. The Confederate victory allowed the local crops to be harvested for Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and protected Lee's lines of communication to West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Got to harvest those crops. The Virginia newspapers and the Confederate soldiers in the battle compared Breckenridge, Breckenridge, Breckenridge to Stonewall Jackson. They're like, do we got uh, finally a Stonewall successor here? I mean, Breckenridge has done well throughout the war. He pretty much has, but he hasn't seen right nothing. nothing really. Well, he was getting whooped by Grant the whole time. That's true. Following Siegel's retreat, Lee suggested that Breckenridge follow the Union Army and invade Maryland. Ooh. However, the flooded rivers in the northern Shenandoah Valley and the length of his supply line prevented Breckenridge from making a pursuit. Breckenridge's forces were transferred to eastern Virginia, where they reinforced Lee's army at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Ooh, we'll see. The victory failed to stop the Union offensive, though. After assuming command of the Army of the Shenandoah, Hunter resumed the march southwest <laughs> and defeated a Confederate force under Brigadier General William E. Grumble Jones at the Battle of Piedmont. Piedmont. Right? On the 5th of June, 1864. Occupying Staunton the following day. So we they shall finally uh, did what they wanted to get do. Get that battle coming up later, as well as obviously the Battle of Cold Harbor, which I think is a pretty decent sized one, if Probably. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Cold Harbor is a good one. And that's going to be June, May 31st to June 12th. So oh, wow. coming up quick. Um, 
The new market, well, uh, the new market ceremony, new market day ceremony, is an annual observance held at VMI in front of the Mount Monument, Virginia, mourning her dead. Oh, a memorial to the New Market Corps. It was sculpted by Cavalier Moses Ritter von Ezekiel, VMI class of 1866, who was a veteran of the battle. Oh. Damn, he's class of... Oh, right, one year after. Right. The names of all the cadets in the Corps of 1864 are inscribed on the monument, and six of the ten who died in the battle are buried at this site. Oh, no shit. Hmm. What it's, happened to the other four? Families actually cared about them and was like, we're, right. we're coming to, to our family plot, right. guys. The ceremony... <laughs> ceremony. The ceremony <laughs> features the roll call of the names of the cadets who lost their lives at Newmarket, a custom that began in 1887. As the name of each cadet who died is called, a representative from the same company in the modern corps answered, Die down the field of honor, sir. Cool. A three volley salute is conducted by a cadet honor guard, followed by taps. And they, that's played over the parade ground. To culminate the ceremony, the entire corps passes Virginia mourning her dead in review. I uh, wonder if that still happens. Or is that outlawed nowadays in today's United States? Sure, I'm sure. Uh, the battlefield is primarily preserved in a 300-acre New Market Battlefield State Historical Park. In addition, the Civil War Trust and its partners have acquired and preserved 20 acres of the battlefield. Nice. Hmm. Fall of 1923, under the direction of Marine Corps Brigadier General Smedley, Smedley Butler, right. and employing the Quantico Smedley, Marines. Smedley! <laughs> uh, and employing the Quantico Marines, the battle was reenacted on its historical ground. Oh. The number of spectators was estimated of over 150,000. That was in 1923. Right. That's what it said. The fall of 1923. Right. 150,000. Right. Uh, Sean McNamara's 2014 film, Fuel of Lost Shoes, a <laughs> fictional, fictionalized account of the actions performed by VMI cadets during the battle. The movie follows a group of seven VMI cadets based on real cactus. John Ford's, did you know that they're actually like teenagers? Well, they are cadets. Right. Like young teenagers. Right. Uh, John Ford's 1959 film, The Horse Soldiers, includes a scene which is loosely based on the event. Oh, cool. A principal character in Elaine Mar Marie's Elfin's 1991 novel, Ghost Cadet, is the ghost of VMI cadet William Hugh McDowell, who was moited in this very battle. Cool. All right. Good for Elaine Marie Elfin. Huh? I would say go check out Field of Lost Shoes, but eh, it's a waste of your time. It's not a very good Civil War movie. That brings us to the Battle of Mansura, All right. which took place May 16th, 1864. We are back in Louisiana because we're in the Red River Campaign again, which we've stalled on for the last couple weeks. Um, it's near Mansura, Louisiana, obviously. As Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, Red River Expeditionary Force from the Department of the Gulf retreated down the Red River. I mean, I can't even remember what happened in the last... Um, battle right. of the Red River campaign. The Confederate forces under Major General Richard Taylor attempted to slow the Union troops' movements and, if possible, deplete their numbers or, better yet, destroy yeah, them. Yeah, I think you'd want to destroy them. Right. The Union forces passed Fort DeRussey, reached Marksville, and then continued east. At Mansura, Taylor massed his forces in an open prairie. That's not good. Ooh. That controlled access to the three roads traversing the area. That's good. Where he hoped his artillery could cause many, many casualties. Many, many, many. And we all know the Rebs, they're not very good with their artillery. Hmm. Early morning, May 16th, 1864. Union forces <laughs> approached. The Union forces, they approached, and skirmishing quickly ensued. After a four-hour fight, which was mostly artillery dual fire, a large Union force massed for a flank attack, inducing the old Rebs to fall back. Uh, the Federales marched to Simsport. Taylor's force harassed the enemy's retrograde movement, but was unable to halt it. So nothing. And that was, I mean, it's pretty much Nathaniel P. Banks, Pona McClellan, and uh, all the Potomac's man, or guys. Right. He's like one of the main ones. He's one of the was only it Banks? ones one of, still there. Yeah, I mean, that was the little old battle there. Which is going to bring us to the last battle of the day, and that's a decent one, I guess. The Battle of Adairsville, where was fought in Atlanta oh. on May 17th, 1864, just northeast of Rome, Georgia, where we left off um, last episode. Right. Following the Battle of Rosaka, which was that uh, battle, 
General Joseph E. Johnson's army retreated southward while Major General William Tecumseh Sherman pursued. Failing to find a good defensive position south of Calhoun, Georgia, Johnston continued to Adairsville while the Confederate cavalry fought a skillful rearguard action and kept Sherman away from Atlanta. For now. All right. For a minute. Oh, this, we're only in May, this Atlanta campaign, I'm pretty sure it goes until like October or something. Once across the Usanala River, Johnston sought to make a stand and draw the old federalities into a costly assault. His expected, he was expected to find favorable terrain near Calhoun, but in this he was disappointed. And during the night of the 17th or the 16th and 17th of May, he led the old what rebels. What do you mean he expected to find favorable terrain near Calhoun? This is your guys' territory. Right. You should have all this shit mapped out already. Right. And the night of the May 16th through the 17th, he led the old rebs southward toward Adairsville. Adairsville. Right. Scheumann followed, <laughs> dividing his forces into three columns right. and advancing on a broad front. There were skirmishes all along the route, but the main bodies were not engaged. Hmm. Not yet. Two miles north of Adairsville, Oliver Otis Howard and the Union Fourth Corps began skirmishing with entrenched units of William J. Hardy's Confederate Corps. Right. The 44th Illinois and 24th Wisconsin Infantry Regiments, led by Major Arthur MacArthur Jr., <laughs> who was the father of Douglas MacArthur, Mac Ar MacArthur, my bad. Mac Arthur MacArthur. Huh? Arthur right. MacArthur. Uh, they should have called his his name should have been Mac Arthur MacArthur. Right. <laughs> Mac Arthur MacArthur. <laughs> mm, <I like> <laughs> it. Well, he attacked Benjamin Cheatham's division and suffered heavy losses. Oh. The rest of Howard's corps prepared for battle, but further attacks were called off by General Thomas. I bet they were. At Adairsville, Johnson once again hoped to find a position in which he could give battle, but there too the terrain was unsuitable for further defense, and the Confederate commander was forced to continue his withdrawal. I bet he was, idiot. Jeez. Johnson usually. Don't we have uh, uh, surveyors and topographical guys or right. whatever the hell they are. Oh, they're idiots. Jeez. As Johnston fell back, he devised a strategy that he hoped would lead to destruction of part of the Scheumann's forces. There were two roads leading south from Adersville, one south to Kingston and the other southeast to Cassville. It seemed likely that Scheumann would divide his armies so it was to use both roads. Right, obviously. This would give Johnson the opportunity to attack one column before the other could come to its aid. When the Southerners abandoned Adersville during the night of the 17th, 18th of May, Johnson sent William Hardy's corps to Kingston while he fell back toward Cassville with the rest of his army. Look at that. Well, there he hoped that Sherman would believe most of the Southerners to be in Kingston and concentrate the bulk of his forces there. Right. Hardy would then hold off the Northerners at Kingston while Johnson with Leonidas Polk and John Hood, Bell Hood that is, destroyed the smaller federal column at Cassville. Oh, destroyed it, huh? Jeez. Sherman reacted as Johnson hoped, ordering James B. McPherson and the bulk of George Henry Thomas's army towards Kingston while sending only John Schofield and the one of core, one core of Thomas's army along the road to Cassville. Okay. Ooh. Uh, morning of 19th of May, 1864, Johnston ordered Hood to uh, march along a country road a mile or east. Country road, march along. Right. A mile or so east of the Adersville Cassville Road and form his corps for battle facing west. While Polk, he attacked the head of the federal column, Hood was to assail its left flank. As Hood was moving into position, he ran into Daniel Butterfield's oh, federal brigade to the east. Butterfield. This was a source of great danger. Uh, for Hood had formed facing west, these federalities would have been in position to attack the exposed flank and the rear of his corps. Well, after a brief skirmish with the Northerners, Hood fell back to rejoin Polk. Johnson, believing that the opportunity for a successful battle had passed, ordered Hood and Polk to move to a new line east and south of Cassville, where they were joined by Hardy, who had been pushed out of Kingston. Oh. Poor guy. Johnson formed his army on a ridge and hoped that Sherman would attack him there on May 20th. As usual, the Southern commander was confident of repulsing the army. Right. Or the enemy as well. Usually they are. Until it happens. Right. During that very night, the old Rebs withdrew across the Etowah River. As they fell back, their feelings were hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Did you recall me? <laughs> their feelings were mixed. They had lost a very strong position at Dalton. Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> and had fallen back from Osaka. Calhoun and Adersville. Yeah, Adairsville, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now they were retreating again under cover of darkness. Right. They already know what happened to Stonewall. Right. Right. We should not be moving at well, darkness. they were retreating, though. Right. So. That morning, as they prepared for battle, their spirits had been high. Well, oh. not no more. Now the disappointment was bitter. Although morale would revive the next few days, 
Many Southern soldiers would never again place as much confidence in Johnston's ability as they once had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Johnston's mm -hmm. been faltering big you time. You can't man. be doing that, Johnston. He's been faltering. I think he wants to lose the war. He's just, he, uh, uh, my how the turns is tabled because this dude is now acting like the Union. Right. Uh, retreating and all I, this shit. I think getting he, chased down throughout all the he his was, own territory. He was decent. And then when Stonewall, I noticed when Stonewall got moited. Yeah, but Johnson was never part of right. the Army of the Potomac. But he knows. When, Sto <laughs> okay. when Stonewall got moited, he's like, damn, that's a major guy. And he did a little faltered a little bit, the decent, and then bam, he found out about Jeb Stewart. He's like, oh man, he's like, I'm literally the last Him and remaining Long big Street. guy, Longstreet and uh, Breckenridge. What happened to Yule? He's dead too, isn't he? Yule? Yeah, well, he's still running around here somewhere. I think he's in like the Missouri or somewhere. Then you got Hood, but what the yeah. fuck's that guy do? Well, well Hood's in a in the uh, north, right? Oh, John Bell Hood was clearly in just in this battle. <laughs> and then you got... Uh, John Bell Hood, what did he do? Because Fort Hood is named after him. So he ended up done something. And then you got Bragg, who's like, yeah. That's going to do for us in this episode of Outlaws. No, Outlaws and Slaveholders. <laughs> uh, <laughs> battles of the Civil War. There's three battles next week, though. We got, I believe, another three battles. But this time it's going to be... Um, what do we got? So we got another Red River campaign. I'm which, down Louisiana. Which is, decent. Which is a nice, decent one. And then we got the little, little battle of uh, Bottomware Church, which uh, is a little squeamish. Bermuda 100 campaign. And then we go back to Virginia, and the big boys are at it again, which is the Battle of North Anna. And it's actually three separate actions of Telegraph Road Bridge, Jericho Mills, and Hanover Junction. But, uh, yeah, that's a big big battle. Mm. Could have been its own episode, but obviously we had to include right. the other ones. So we got some big major fighting coming up next week as right. the Overland campaign shifts into full gear. Full gear. And we're not even in the middle of that yet. Mm -mm. No battle of, uh, no Atlanta campaign, though, uh, this next episode. But we got a lot of stuff coming up. Cold Harbor, like I said, that's going to be probably in an episode or two. And when did when did the Atlanta campaign stop? I'm pretty sure that Atlanta campaign like went September second, eighteen sixty four. Yeah, a couple months. So it went forever though. March to the sea is that what it is? Yep, Showman's March to the sea. He was sea. replaced with the more aggressive John Bell Hood, who began challenging the Union army in a series of costly frontal assaults. Hood's army was eventually besieged in Atlanta. The city fell September second, actually it's not setting the stage for Sherman's March to the sea. Not March to the sea yet. Yeah, it was, it was the March to the Sea that was the later part. Right. Yeah, we got some good stuff, dude. 1864, bye-bye, Confederates. Yeah. Sorry for you. You're just holding on by a thread at this point. They've been holding on by a thread. Ridiculous. <laughs> there's, there's there's nothing in uh, 1865. Right. Except for the Battle of App Appomattox, Appomattox Courthouse. And the Battle of Fort Blakely. I don't even think that was big. No. <laughs> It was just important. It's an A battle because it was right. important. Uh, yeah, I mean, we still it was 45,000 against 4,000. Oh, my gosh. But it was a fort, so it makes sense. But those 4,000 killed 150 of those guys compared to 75 killed on uh, their side. So. Right. Um, yeah. Well, we still got months and months of this left, so. Lots of stuff coming up. Like I said, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network on YouTube. <laughs> you can get this plus bad, uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers, which is a true crime podcast, and Jeez. Lee and Corey on the Case, which is a scripted slash improv comedy series about two private investigators, as well as our YouTube exclusive video, Dart League. And. Yeah, that's it. We'll be back next week for three more battles as the Overland campaign is heating up. We got big armies. Big armies. Going at it. Mm. We'll see you next week. We're the Mother Michigan as we. Bing, bing.